Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Leslie Hadfield. Um, we know Leslie well here at the Kennedy Center because she is the coordinator of our Africana Studies program. Uh, she, and her, she earned her PhD in African history at Michigan State University, and she's been teaching African history here at BYU since 2010. Um, she primarily studies South African contemporary social and political history, and her research interests include South African liberation movements and the experience of black nurses in the Eastern Cape, and she'll be talking to us about that uh, today. Oral history is an important part of her work, and we'll also um, have see, see the evidence of that as well. She's conducted extensive interviews in South Africa in both English and the Kosha, Kosa, that's closest, okay, yeah, I can't say it, obviously, uh, language which, which Leslie speaks, and also she speaks Swahili, understand, and uh, attends church at a Swahili branch in Salt Lake. Um, she has been involved also in the African refugee community in Salt Lake City. Um, she has uh, written, had one book published called Liberation and Development, Black Consciousness Community Programs in South Africa. She's compl nearing completion uh, of a second book, and I think the research she's going to be uh, sharing with us today is from that second book project. Um, I've also been told she's a member of an African dance group. I have not seen her perform, but I've been told that it is impressive. Um, she's also famous for being a member of the legendary BYU A-Lot flag football team. Now, if somehow you have not heard about this team. This is a team of women faculty members here at BYU who perform. Um, she, she, she plays running back. I was hoping to have a little video shot. You, you can find this online of her, you know, bursting through a hole to get a first down. Um, but because of our technical difficulties, we couldn't manage it. Um, but anyway, you can find this online. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's impressive. And um, they, don't, they say that they don't win very often, but they always console themselves by the fact, as their um, team is named, that they have better parking than the students that they play, right? Because they have a lot, and that they always end each game by chanting, good parking always wins. Uh, but anyway, uh, Leslie is uh, a terrific scholar and teacher. We're very grateful to have her uh, presenting to us today. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Hadfield. Thank you, Stan. I'm excited today to come and talk about Zochi. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, her full name is Noma Zocho Gladys Nyakati Mkako, and she, we, a lot of people know her as Zochi. She is one of, she's in the middle there, obviously, um, she's one of those people who make you feel like sh you are special to her, and you're the specialist person, and you, yet you know that she feels that way, or she makes other people feel that way. And so it's, she's just one of those great people. And that is an important part of her character, you'll see as I talk more about her. Um, I first met her 10 years ago through Mrs. Nziki Biko when I was doing research for my first book. And I interviewed both uh, Mrs. Biko and Zochi uh, because I wanted to know what it was like to work as a nurse in South Africa in the 1970s. And my interview with the two of them led to this, um, my current book project. And I quickly uh, thereafter saw that Zochi is a remarkable and beloved woman in the township of Ginsburg. In fact, um, I am currently working on a creating a, an exhibit about her life with Andile, Andile Mafrika, who is pictured there with us. Uh, we interviewed Zochi. This was actually in 2013. We interviewed her in multiple times because we felt that her story needed to be recorded and presented. Um, and it's going to, this exhibit is going to be housed in the Steve Biko Center in Ginsburg. The address of this center is number one, Zochi Street. So it gives you an idea of how important she's been to this community. And I'm going to present today a little bit about her work um, and how she fulfilled uh, these different roles that women can have, and I argue that her life shows us how many roles and influences women can have uh, in society, and in Zochi's case, her courageous and caring personality, <laughs> and her mothering, and skilled work 
in the community led her to um, have a, a unique political influence as the mayor of Ginsburg in the late 1980s. So let me talk a little bit more about her as a person. Um, so South Africa, as you may know, um, in, uh, from 1948 to 1990, was under the system of apartheid, a white supremacist system in South Africa. And uh, so it affected life, but that happened, a, a lot of the things, the foundations of apar apartheid um, were laid before 1948, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But I also wanted to point out on the map that Zochi grew up, she was born in Ginsburg, which is a small, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, small town outside of, let me use the pointer here, um, King Williamstown, which is near Bisho, which is on the map. And then she later went to work for a few months here in Freiburg in the Northwest. So just keep that in mind as I talk more about her. She was born January 18th, 1937. So just this month, she celebrated her 82nd birthday. And she was born to Antoinette Mamtolo and Tolbert Uzocho in a rendezvous in Ginsburg um, in the Tzolo part of it. Now, I, I <coughs> said the names of her parents' clan names Tolo and Zocho, and you can hear she was named after her, her father's clan name, Noma Zocho, meaning that she's from the Zocho clan, and so that's where her name comes from, Zochi. She was, uh, Ginsburg at the time was a, a poor place. It's a settlement on the outskirts of the town, of King Williamstown, and it's a segregated community of workers, African workers. There were a number of other groups there, um, some people of mixed race descent, well, you can see here in this picture, I don't know who the nurses are, but you can see those white buildings, and this is what a lot of the buildings looked like. These wattle and daub huts with thatched roofs and two windows, and these were rented from the city, so the city was providing housing, but not great housing, and um, they later built some square cement houses with metal roofing, but Zocho was, or Zochi was born in um, the Zolo area of this place, which was um, would have had similar uh, housing that you see here, and and Zolo was later subsumed under Ginsburg. Zochi remembers um, Ginsburg as poor and overcrowded when she was growing up. That led to TB and malnutrition. They had communal bathrooms, and she talked about this in the interviews. People would go and wash w in these areas. With there was. A a long tap on one side that poured into this cement basin. And she remembered waiting for when the people who would come and clean these communal bathrooms to come. And then she would rush in as soon as it was clean so that she could use a clean, a clean bathroom. Um, in her household, there were a very few beds. And the children, there are a number of children who slept on the floor and sometimes even outside because there was not room for all the people. And I want to say a few things about um, this environment she grew up in. There were a lot of people in her house because she grew up with her maternal grandmother who was one of these strong, caring women and a committed Christian um, who I think she followed after. And her grandmother uh, was called Mama Duna or Mam Duna. And um, she was from a family of Amaklercha, which is the term for diviners or healers in Kosa. And so in a way, you could say that Zochi had this um, healing in her blood. But her, her grandmother, Mom Duna, was always helping people. And she would say, you must never, never chase away people. Never, ever chase away a person. I'm quoting from Zochi now. A person who comes in must never go out of this house without getting tea or bread, whatever food is there. But he or she must get something to eat, because perhaps he or she comes because she's hungry. Or, and then uh, her, she says her grandmother was very strict about that. So there were a lot of people in her house that her grandmother um, took care of. And she was, again, a committed Christian. Zochi went to church with her every time she was there with her on Sunday. Um, she grew up, uh, she lost her parents at an early age, uh, her mother at age five and her father at age seven, if I'm not mistaken. And so she grew up in her maternal grandmother's house, but um, her uh, father's sister, her uh, paternal aunt, there's a particular term, Utado Bao, uh, in Klausa, uh, her aunt Louisa, who I'm going to show you a picture of here in later years, she um, also uh, helped Zochi and raised her. And because um, Cape Town, a much bigger city, had more opportunities, she ended up taking Zochi and Zochi's brother to Cape Town. They lived with other people, but there were 
her, her, her aunt could um, have better work there and they had some better education. So Zochi grew up in Cape Town as well when they moved from Ginsburg. And she said there she really was committed to education. Um, she said in these townships, these segregated settlements for black people in South Africa, you see, quote, all these funny things. Um, people making decisions, maybe doing drugs, uh, getting into criminal behavior, uh, with poverty um, being a, a kind of a catalyst there. And she even lost her brother. Uh, he got sick. They suspect that he had TB and he, he died, which was, which was a difficult thing for her. But she knew she wanted an education. And she said, because I know where I come from, I have nothing, nothing, nothing. So if I get an education, at least I'll have something in hand. And she did very well. She even skipped a grade because she did so well. Um, so as she was, education was a really important part of her early life. But she also enjoyed friends and sports. And she told us how she was part of a group of four girls in high school who were considered these noisemakers or troublemakers. And she still kept in touch with them, even um, as she we um, interviewed her. She talked about keeping in touch with these friends. She also talked about going to watch rugby matches and having a great time there and uh, taking off her high heels and running with her friends. And this is one thing about Zochi that is important, is that she keeps friends. And this um, people can feel that genuine um, aspect of her friendship. In 1957, um, so after graduating from high school, uh, she entered uh, Frere Hospital in East London, so very near King Williamstown, uh, back near her birthplace. Um, and she entered this hospital for training, general nursing training. Um, she, as a student who excelled in school, though she proved herself capable of studying beyond high school, and she was able to get a profession, but um, she did not have the funds to continue on to be a social worker, which is what she really wanted to do because she loved people. Um, so she chose nursing. In the 1950s in South Africa, black nursing was on the rise. There was a huge growth in the training of black nurses and the hiring of black nurses. By this time, nursing had gained prestige as one of the few professions open to black women. Teaching, nursing, and social work were other professions. And there was a growing interest among young <coughs> black women to become nurses. Whereas in prior decades, mission-educated elite women mostly became nurses. These are those who were um, of the maybe traditional ruling classes. The growing demand for black nurses at this time in, in hospitals opened up more training opportunities. And for young black women succeeding in school, like Zochi, um, the nursing uh, offered a way to study while further getting paid. So they, she was able, this is why she chose nursing, she could get this profession, but also get paid at the same time. She completed a three-year course in general nursing, then worked at Frere Hospital before going back to Cape Town for her midwifery training. Many nurses in South Africa have midwifery, midwifery training on top of their general nursing. It's um, especially if you're working in community clinics, it's almost required um, because you have to deal with maternity cases. She went to St. Monica's Maternity Hospital, which was an Anglican hospital with a very high standard of training. Upon finishing her training, she secured a post in the northwest province of South Africa in Freiburg, which I pointed out earlier. And she really enjoyed her work, but um, she struggled with the language barriers there. There are 11 official languages in South Africa, and so when she moved to this other region, she couldn't understand a lot of the language, and it was also very far from home. So she eventually made her way back, wait, sorry, made her way back to the Eastern Cape and back to Ginsburg, where she started working at the Ginsburg Clinic in January of 1969. So she eventually comes back. And here, Zochi was committed to using her skills to provide health care to her community. She had gained, um, through this, she gained an intimate knowledge of the community's challenges as her work sent her into the homes of many Ginsburg residents. And as a health educator and healer, she practiced work akin to mothering. So I'll talk a little bit more that, about that later. Again, a little bit more about the context here in the late 1960s and early 1970s in South Africa. Nelson Mandela and other liberation movement leaders were in jail or they were in exile, working underground. And there, the apartheid really was entrenched in the 1960s. This in intensified racial segregation in housing and a, a number of different aspects. Even though an economic boom in the 1960s gave people more opportunities, 
um, still there was job reservation and what they called Bantu education, which meant that they were going to educate um, the African people only to a certain level so that they could be in subservient positions in society. So at this time in the early 1970s, the black consciousness movement in South Africa was growing and this grew among university students, black university students, and they, uh, some of the activists, um, including Steve Biko, he was banned to Ginsburg, which was his hometown, and so he was coming back to work in the community, and that is where my first book intersects with um, Zochi's story. So um, Zochi and two other fully qualified nurses worked from a small clinic in Ginsburg that was once a house on the main road, so very small area. They carried a heavy workload dealing with general and minor cases during the day, and then someone always had to be on call. Um, they, so as they were running clinics, TB clinics, antenatal clinics, well baby clinics, they also had to deal with emergencies uh, during the night. And because of the poverty and overcrowding in Ginsburg, TB was a major uh, problem that they dealt with along with malnutrition. If you know Kwashiorkor and Marasmus, they were diseases that they encountered, especially among children. They also made a lot of home visits, which I mentioned before, to follow up with patients and give some health education. And they delivered babies all over the township. So this really was a big part of her work. Um, district surgeons, so the public surgeons, were supposed to be visiting the clinic once a week, but they found it was easier with the main hospital in town for the nurses to just uh, give referrals to um, uh, the surgeons if they had emergency cases. So this kind of work really required great skill. And so I want to emphasize that. Zochi had this um, skill in maternity uh, or dealing with maternity cases um, and because of her training, but also because of her experience, and this was especially difficult with maternity cases because, as nurses told me, you're dealing with two lives. Two healthy beings come in. You've got to have two healthy beings come out of this um, event of birth. Yeah, and she emphasized that you must do proper findings. So these are women who are doing this outside of a hospital, far from doctors. And through this, she earned a lot of respect and gratitude. In fact, some people named their children after nurses who helped them through a difficult delivery. And they would later show their children on the street, maybe five years later, do you recognize this person? She's your baby. Um, and so they, they, they really um, endeared themselves to the community through this. One example of this that I want to show is uh, there was a, uh, around 1970, there were some floods. And Ginsburg is connected through King Williamstown. There's, it's, it's kind of on the opposite of a, a river. And so you, right now they have a, a bridge you can drive across, but at the time they only had a, a walkway um, and that bridge was broken and there, were fl there was flooding, the rain was coming down, it was raining, 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 as she said. And she was called to help a woman deliver uh, a baby at home and discovered that this was a breech birth. The feet were coming first. And usually, in that case, she would send the woman right to the hospital, but because of the floods, she could not do that. So she had to um, do this birth at night. It was very difficult. And I, this is why we're having some technical difficulties, but it's going to be worth it because you get to hear Zochi's voice as she tells what she did here. So I'm going to see if I can do this. It was a, a very difficult thing. Now the woman, because it wasn't her first baby, she wanted to know what's happening. Mm. I've long been pushing mm. and nothing comes out. What is happening, Noma Zojo? <laughs> and in the end, I had to tell her, no, this is a breach. Mm -hmm. Please do whatever I tell you. Just cooperate and the mm -hmm. truth. Of course, she did just that shame and in the end, she delivered. Puruchu, one leg came out, <laughs> and mind you, we have no electricity. And the one who was holding <laughs> the lamp put the lamp down and ran away. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're not supposed to do that. And do she left us with no lamp. No. <laughs> I said, Yeah, it's fine, my dear. Come here. So in such cases, you know, that... Okay.
you get the sense. I wanted to play this too so you could hear Zochi's personality coming through as she um, related that story. Now the other person who is uh, in the interview, this is when I interviewed Mrs. Biko as well. And as I said before, um, Steve Biko, who's uh, Mrs. Biko's husband, um, Steve Biko was later killed by the apartheid government in 1977. But when he was banned to Ginsburg, um, they, they moved there, he'd grown up there, and he knew that Zochi and the other nurses had an idea of what was happening in the community. And he um, was restricted to this town, but he wanted to establish the community programs he and his uh, colleagues were doing in Ginsburg. So he consulted with Zochi, and um, he asked her, what, what would you want us to do? So one of the outcomes of this consultation was the reopening of the Ginsburg creche, or uh, daycare center for children. So in her home visits, uh, Zochi was walking around Ginsburg on foot with um, her colleagues, and one day she and, and another nurse found two small children outside one of these houses that you saw there, and they were eating this mealy meal porridge, this um, uh, maize meal porridge, and uh, there was a dog eating the porridge with them, but they were so young they couldn't drive the dog away, and they said, what is going on here? So they went to a neighbor's house, and they you know, said, what's happening here? The mother is not home. So they went back, and, and the house was locked, by the way. So they went back later when they knew the, the mother was home, and she said this was, of course, after hours, but they were concerned nurses, so they went back, and they said, "What you know, we came earlier. We want to know what's happening. The mother broke down and cried. She had to lock the house when she went out because other people or things might come in, animals might come in the house and take what's there, but she didn't have anybody to watch her children, and she had to go to work, and so she left them outside. Um, the community daycare center or creche had been closed down because of a dispute over money, and there was somebody who owned it. Who there, was, there was this, this he, he didn't seem very, um, wasn't concerned about the community, apparently. And so he, uh, when Biko asked Sochi what they would have them do, she said the first thing would be to open that, that creche again. And so this is another example of how she was uh, involved in the community and really cared about her community. She also acted as an advocate for the people in a number of ways um, as a nurse. And she proved that she cared about her people this way as well. And she used her courage and integrity, um, or she, her courage and integrity really shone through when she stood up to well my, oh, sorry, white male doctors. Um, there was one incident in Freiburg that she talked about where she had a case of an antepartum hemorrhage, so the woman is bleeding before she was going to give birth, and she was taught that in, in her training, you don't palpate, you don't try to figure out what's happening, you just send this woman to the hospital. So she took the woman to the hospital in Freiburg, and she, as she was telling this story, she said, um, I can be cool at times, and when I need to be, I can be very wrong, too. Meaning that she, the nurses were told to be respectful, but there were times that she had to speak out. When she, she brought the woman to the doctor, and the doctor asked her, well, why are you sending her here? And she said, she's bleeding. And he said, well, how far is she? And she said, I don't know. And he said, why don't you know? And she said, well, I've been taught. You don't palpate on a woman if she's got antepartum hemorrhage. And, um, and she said to him, um, he, he had this really angry tone, and, and she said, I trained at St. Monica's Hospital. That's the best hospital you can get for midwifery. My lecturer told me never to do a PV on a patient who is bleeding. It is done in a hospital situation where everything is ready for a cesarean if need be. Then I nicely took my things and said, over to you, doctor. Bye. <laughs> and left the, the patient there. Um, and then she later, the, another nurse came in laughing, and she said that the, uh, about the incident, and she said the doctor said, he had told her the story and said, she is very cheeky, but she knows her work. <laughs> so working in the, in the Gray Hospital in King Williamstown could be really difficult, too, with racial discrimination. And she told a story of a woman who was having her 10th child. And she referred her to the hospital. But the people there said, oh, those nurses in Ginsburg, they're lazy. Go back to them. They just don't want to help you. Well, the baby was really big. And so there was a reason why they sent her to the hospital. So she wrote a letter to the doctor. And the doctors actually worked pretty well with them. She got her to the hospital, but even with the C-section, the baby died. And as Zochi re related this later, she said, I really cried that day when that woman started telling me, relating the whole story. She was crying. I also cried with her because I'd referred the patient early to the hospital, but there they had uh, sent the patient back. 
She also provided leadership amongst the nurses as she was acting as an advocate for her people. Um, because of the apartheid system, a young white nurse uh, was, she has, was appointed as a manager of the clinic, so all of these um, outlying clinics, even though she was unqualified, but because she was white, they put her in this position. And they were having trouble with her, and finally one day they almost lost um, a, a patient and some other nurses from another clinic called her clinic. She called everybody together. They got a meeting. They, they asked for a meeting with the manager, and they, they um, told everybody, or they, they told the manager, what the most senior uh, manager, what was going on, and they eventually the, the woman resigned um, because they exposed the problems. But Zochi also, in this case, she took, because she was more senior and she um, had that personality, she, um, she took that into her hands. Okay, Zochi also is known in the community as a mother, and this is a really important role that she has played. She had her own children, Zola and Linda, two sons, um, only a few years apart, born early in her career, uh, one in 1964 and the other in 1967 or 68. I need to check that with, with Zochi. Um, and at times her family helped uh, her raise them, but she mostly raised them herself. And as you can see in the picture on the left here, she took in many other children as well, just like Mom Duna. Um, she took in children of relatives who needed to relocate for whatever reason, who needed better care or a chance to go to school, or those who needed a home away from home. So um, cousins of her sons at, at the time of um, some Soweto the student uprisings in 1976, they came to stay with her. Um, this was when <coughs> school youth were demonstrating against apartheid education and they shut down the schools in many areas. Um, that was a major event. Um, she took in Zetu, who was the daughter of a relative whose mother drank, and so she and her Aunt Luisa also uh, took her in, Zetu. Um, Nosipo was an uncle's child whose home life was not good, so Zochi took her in and raised her as well. Another cousin of um, Lindile, uh, another relative who was going to Fort Hare, and so she stayed with, with a, a nearby university, so she, she stayed with Zochi during the holidays and Nombuso Blom, I could go on and on. Um, Zochi noticed um, this one uh, daughter of a relative was not going to school after a certain grade, so she took her in, and you can see on the right, I can't remember exactly who it is graduating here, but there's Zochi speaking at the graduation of one of these people. Um, she took in children of friends from Cape Town, her house was always full, and she said she could not chase them away because she knew what it was like to not be happy where she was. And her aunt had taken her in and her grandmother taught her to never turn people away. So she has so many children who regard her as a mother that she forgets the number. And you can imagine at age 82. But she never treated her children differently from the others. And this is, again, one thing that really endeared her to the people. Um, it was Zochi's dedication then to her work as a community nurse her mothering to so many people in the community that led to her success as a politician in a particularly turbulent time in South Africa. Um, she knew that the community, she knew the community and they knew her. Plus she worked in a more neutral profession that provided this service. And um, at the time, the apartheid government had set up these councils and these segregated um, settlements or townships, and many felt that this was a way to co-opt people, because they'd say, okay, you are the government of this group, um, but really what they were doing is, you're going to carry out all this apartheid, um, all these policies. And so this was a difficult position that these uh, township counselors had. And uh, when she was, when I asked a, another historian how I might find out how many other female uh, mayors had uh, been elected to these positions at this time, this is what he wrote. Tough one, guess she was an exception and probably a sellout as those who operated within the apartheid system were defined then. So Zochi became a leader at this time when it was difficult to be a leader in that position. But because of her position, it made her even more of an exception. She was not, it was not just that she was a woman in this position, but also she was not viewed as a sellout because the township really respected her. Um, and, uh, Andile Mafrika, who is doing this project with me, he grew up in Ginsburg, was friends of Zochi's sons, and um, he became involved in these anti-apartheid movements, adhering strongly to black consciousness, which was uh, uh, understandable with Steve Biko's influence there in Ginsburg. And when 
um, we talked about the title of the exhibit and this presentation, he suggested that mother should actually come at the end of the title to emphasize that this was a really important role that she played, and I'll just read what he wrote. The motherly, the motherly side was a huge factor that granted her acceptance to the people as a mayor. Remember, it was during the hot periods in community struggles. Those who were part of the ruling system, the police, community councilors, Bantustan politicians, were the most immediate target of the anger of the people. But with Zochi, people were disempowered by her motherliness. The knowledge that her record in helping people with their diverse problems was undisputed, and she was a girl of known parents who, in their right, were dis decent members of the community. So mother could be the flagship here. <coughs> I thought that was a very important point. Um, Zochi did not have political aspirations herself because she was just a community nurse, but it was other people in the community who came to her to ask her to run for office. She was first elected as an ordinary councilor member, and then after one or two years, she was elected as a deputy mayor and then within the council, and then a couple of years after that, elected as mayor. Many times, because of the, this is in the early to mid-1980s, um, she was the only woman in the council meetings, and when they would go to address the white council in town, because they had to work with them, um, it made her nervous to stand up and address so many people, um, but um, she did it, and, and she said, quote, you know there were times you felt that this is being done because you are a woman. So sometimes she was in these meetings, and she could tell, no, you're treating me this way because I'm a woman. Uh, but, she said, I had to stand my ground. And she remembered a particular time when uh, at some government retreat, so they're bringing council members from other places together, um, they had elected a committee without any women. So she raised the issue. There were other women from the councils there, so there was no reason why they shouldn't have a woman on the council. And there was a man who stood up to say they would not be told what to do by a woman. So she, quote, took an exception to that, and I marched out. And everyone was angry and said the man must apologize, which he eventually did. But because of that respect that she had and she was willing to speak out, she did that. If she encountered any problems related to gender discrimination in her own council, she said that she would just tackle it then and there. And she um, said that they would thrash things out. She said, we, we behaved or we kept ourselves like a family, you know. Whenever there were things that we did not understand or we did not see eye to eye, we would sit down and thrash things out. And she thought that they did this because they were used to each other. They knew each other in the community, but also because they were Christians. So they... They had that, that Christian way of dealing with each other. Um, being nice to each other, I guess, is what she was saying. So um, things the council accomplished under her leadership were pretty important, and one of them was that they did away with those communal t restrooms. And she remembered growing up and struggling with that, and so under her watch, uh, they made sure that they had the infrastructure so that each house had its own bathroom. They could have the plumbing. And then she improved the infrastructure by um, tarring the roads. They always had dirt roads, um, and uh, they provided new housing. And she also used her reports um, on the health problems of overcrowding to back up her request. So this was a way that she could get the white government to eventually agree to these things. And in dealing with the white government, her courageous and caring char characteristics combined to help her stick up for her people. And I want to, oh, I forgot. Here's a picture of her as mayor in her mayoral robes. And I'm going to play um, what she talked about, how she stuck up to for her people at times. I'm a bull. We at had that to time. push and fight, and uh, at times we used to fight. Fight, I remember one time, you know, one, one of the Amapulus said, Who is this woman who is so stubborn? That was me. <laughs> well, I was stubborn at that time because I, I, I knew what I wanted for my people, mm -hmm. for my home. You know, I had that feeling that this is my home. Mm. These are my people, you know, the old Tina in Amakosa, we used to say, Abandu Abakul, whoever is older mm. than me or my mother's age is my mother. Mm. Or Tata Abam, Abandu Anabam, mm. you know, my people. That's what we used to say. So I knew what I wanted for my people, 
for my home and so on. Okay, so you get a sense for what it might have been like to be in a meeting with Zochi and where she would um, stick up for her people. She remembered one particular meeting where the white government presented, they were very excited about this, we are going <coughs> to give you shacks in your settlements. And Zochi said throughout this presentation she kept very quiet because she was so cross. And when they asked her, but you know, why are you not saying anything? She said, not in my township, never, never, never. She wanted to have the same development that white people had, and she said, we're not taking these shacks. Um, eventually, um, this was, so we're getting to the late 1980s and early 1990, when Mandela was uh, released and the African National Congress and other liberation movements were declared unbanned, Zochi and her council resigned. They said, it's time, we, don't, uh, we are no longer necessary and there's going to be a new government and so that was the end of her political career. She retired as a nurse about five years later, uh, but she continued to be active in her church and in the Retired Nurses Association that she helped found with other colleagues. And so throughout her life um, since then, so this is 1995 is when she retired, so she's been involved many years since then. Um, she has continued with her various roles in with her professional associations, her civic engagement, her mothering, and her church. And throughout, I would say that she has really used her, her skills, her technical skills, nursing skills, her caring, and her courage to make her community better. Um, and, and she also then s continues to be a friend and uh, a role model for many. And you can see her here. Um, in her church on the left, and then she's in the left on this picture with a friend of hers in some traditional Xhosa clothing. So I'd be happy to take questions. Um, we have probably about five minutes before people have to leave for class. Yeah, can you please uh, turn to the microphone to ask your question? We are filming this. That way your question is heard as well as the question is a response. So, <coughs> so it's a two-part question. The first mm -hmm. is, um, what was the biggest adversity Zochi faced being a black um, female nurse, and how did she overcome it? Mm -hmm. And then the second um, part is, what advice would she give to future black women wanting to go into the nursing field? Okay, great. I wish we had Zochi here so that she could answer these questions. Um, I think when I talked to her about the, uh, the biggest adversity she faced as a, as a black female nurse at the time, um, she really struggled, uh, well, of course there's the, the context that she's working in, which is built by apartheid and, and previous regimes where there's overcrowding in these townships, there's a lot of poverty, and so it really was her education that helped her overcome that part of her life that she was disadvantaged from birth with. Um, and then um, also her audacity, her, her courage um, to just continue with that um, but when she was working, it was really tough to work with some white doctors and um, with the system that would undermine her authority. Um, and there she was one of the most qualified. And so for her to be persistent with her caring and to work after hours, as you, as you heard her going to visit, um, and standing up and really arguing and not letting people walk over her, I think that's how she overcame those things. Um, Advice to future nurses, a lot of the nurses I interviewed would say you have to be patient with your patients. You have to take them as someone who's coming to you as if they are your family member. And so Zochi um, would, I think, echo a lot of, of those um, to, to female, uh, to young black women, um, I think in general, she would say you just need to you know, be committed to your education. And, and she really is a strong Christian, and so I think she would also um, uh, encourage people in that as well. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. What are the lasting effects of apartheid? For example, like what would someone in Sochi's position today face if they tried to accomplish similar things? That is a good question. So they're still struggling economically, a lot of people. Even though South Africa has done well, the majority of people still struggle to have enough education to get better jobs. Um, Ginsburg still struggles a lot. It, it's done much better. 
um, in a lot of ways, and there are many more opportunities open for people. So a lot of people now in these managerial positions are black, and, and there's um, affirmative action to help with that. But there are a lot of people still with those years and years of having the, not having those educational opportunities, not having the jobs, um, um, they're still struggling. Um, but there are, there are a lot of strong African women in South Africa who um, do, who I think it's um, much more possible for them to be in these government positions. Um, and you see that in the African National Congress. Um, a lot of the speaker um, in the parliament is a woman. The heads of the Eastern Cape province have been women before. So um, there definitely <coughs> people like Zochi have paved the way um, for that to happen, but there's still a lot of uh, challenges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Zochi's life was so amazing. With us being in a different time and a different place today, what lesson from her life do you think is the most applicable to us here? So this is, this is the first time I've presented on this, and Andile and I are working on this exhibit, so I, this is kind of a preliminary answer to that. But as I was thinking about what made Zochi who she was and, and helped her succeed and have the influence she had, I really do think is a combination of her, really, her caring personality and her mothering, not only to her own children but other children, as well as her skills. And so I think if you can um, have, and, and of course the courage too. So those kind of characteristics where you, you need to go out and push and stand for what you believe in and work for your people, but she did it in a way where it was genuine and people really knew she cared about her and she, she really is a, a genuine friend. And th those are important characteristics to have um, even when you have to fight for things. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering what inspired you most about Zochi, like on first meeting her that made you want to like learn so much about her and gain new perspectives on her life? Thank you for that question. I hope you could kind of hear through her voice that she, she is very upbeat. And so when I first met her, she was, she was and she tells great stories. So as a historian who does oral history, you love people who tell s great stories. And she would say in the first interview, oh, you, you can't miss this one. I gotta tell you this story. And so then uh, she would tell about, um, and they would be difficult, but you can hear that she's also laughing. And, and this is part of her personality that she, she really reaches out to people and makes you feel like you are her friend. Um, and that is what inspired me to think about all the, the work she did and these nurses also, I didn't mention this before, but they rarely lost, they rarely had a death in childbirth, even though they were working without electricity, dealing with breech births. Um, so you can't take them to the hospital for a C-section. You have gotta deal with it right there. And these nurses rarely um, lost uh, people in that. So that, that was one of the things when I, the first interview I thought I have to follow up on this. Thank so you. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I had a question. You kind of mentioned how um, at times she had to be stubborn when she was a mayor in an office. Mm -hmm. And I feel like oftentimes women in politics get like plagued as being cold and insensitive when they're that way. Right. So how was she able to offset that? I really think, um, as Andile said, that she was already seen as a mother and somebody who cared. And so and remember, this is later in her life. This is she served when she, she retired in 1995. So. She, she'd already had this career, another career. Mm -hmm. um, she, she wasn't right in politics. And I think, um, you know, I don't know, it's because I know a lot of people who know her personally, maybe there were other people who saw her that way and said, like, who is this stubborn woman? You know, and maybe she wasn't even asking for something that big, but mm -hmm. because she was a woman and she was sticking to it, maybe then she was perceived in a different way. But I think within her own community, um, people really um, admired her and saw her as genuinely trying to help. So thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you mentioned in some of those stories that she was um, in her nursing career. She was attending some births at home, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if that um, if that was because she was a black nurse, or if nursing in South Africa. Um, models more of how we in America view like midwives or doulas and if that has changed now? That's a great question. So a lot of it is because the healthcare, they, there were not as many hospitals 
And the people, the, okay, South Africa has a combination of public and private um, hospitals and, and healthcare systems. So in the public side, district nurses, as they were called, um, they were sent out to go around to people's houses and do this work that not everybody could come to the hospital for. And so there were a number of nurses, and then even in the, the, through the 1960s and 70s, this increased the people that were out in clinics because they knew we have to give health care to these people, but there's no way we can put hospitals in all these areas. Um, so in a way, yes, it was because she was a black nurse, but also because of the system in South Africa, which was shaped by um, basically racism and other issues. Um, so there were a lot of other nurses who were, who were doing that. Um, did I answer your question? And there was another part to it that I think I perhaps did um, I guess, is it still that way today, or has it shifted more towards um, like privatization in hospitals? Um, there are st there's still um, th there's still a dual system in South Africa, and there are people still out working in these clinics, um, and and they're they're really important as gateways to the hospitals. Um, so it's still it's still that the public system though is it has a lot of um, problems um, because of lack of resources, um, and and so th they're. Dealing with some of the same, mm -hmm. but also magnified issues in the in the public system. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.